Again, thank you for joining us today, and I will now turn it over to today's presenters. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here today. Um, welcome to this time together. I think to begin us, I, um, we have a quote up here by jo Joey Harjo on the screen. And if, if you could um, take a look at that for us for a moment, um, read those words and then, and then perhaps sit with the image that's there as we take, um, as we close our eyes and just take three uh, deep breaths and prepare ourselves for um, our time together ahead, um, the content that we'll be learning um, and really uh, just our ability to reflect on, on what it all means for us and our roles uh, with the youth that we're serving. So um, if we could take a second to just close your eyes with me, um, plant your feet on the ground, wherever you are, get comfortable. And just go ahead and take three deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. Thank you. Uh, my name is Laura Gay. I am a training and technical assistance manager at the National Native Children's Trauma Center, and we are partners uh, within the Tribal Youth Resource Center. A little bit about my background. I've been with the Trauma Center for four years, and, and the bulk of my uh, work history prior to that is um, doing uh, child welfare work uh, as a direct caseworker, as a supervisor, and then some uh, training and development. Um, but in my time at the Trauma Center, really what the focus has been on is partnering with tribes who are interested in uh, enhancing or developing their child serving system to uh, be sustainably trauma informed and resilience focused um, and, and more, most often with a, uh, attention to uh, the cultural practices that are in place that support uh, building resilience within youth and within uh, families and within the community as a whole. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Ashley Troutman, my colleague, to introduce herself. Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for um, tuning in today. My name is Ashley Troutman. I serve as an assistant professor in the School of Social Work here at the University of Montana. Um, and part of my role, I also serve as a juvenile justice and technical assistance specialist at the National Native Children's Trauma Center. And I've been doing that work um, for about the last seven years. And so my background is really in social work and law. And uh, I have a real interest in thinking about um, how how to support tribal communities and systems that are building trauma-informed um, or moving towards trauma-informed care and service delivery, especially when it comes to the intersection between social work and law. So, um, for example, how we support um, agencies and communities in building um, trauma-informed laws and policies um, and things like that. So thanks so much again for, um, for tuning in, and we look forward to walking alongside you of this content um, for the next um, 90 minutes or so. Thank you, Ashley. So today we're going to be uh, providing you with some information um, that comes from a curriculum called Think Trauma. And this was developed by the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, of which the National Native Children's Trauma Center is a part of. Um, and this training was really developed originally um, to support uh, those who were providing services to youth and juvenile justice settings, uh, most often provided to uh, staff within juvenile detention centers. I think what we've done is broaden the content so that it's really more reflective of um, uh, to be helpful and supportive to anyone working with youth who um, are at risk or who are involved in the juvenile justice system. 
We're going to cover four different modules today. I'll be talking to you um, about the first one um, and just talking about what is trauma, what are some of the impacts, and, and what specifically do we need to know about trauma and um, youth who have juvenile justice involvement. Ashley's going to be picking it up in about 45 minutes to talk about trauma's impact on development. And then tomorrow, our colleagues, uh, Dr. Uh, Marilyn Zimmerman and Deborah Kleeman, will be talking to you about the last two modules talking trauma in the context trauma in context and different uh, coping uh, skills that are born out of survival and um, uh, and then as well as some healthy uh, coping skills we can help um, uh, teach youth to support to support them and then um, lastly talking about um, lastly but probably <laughs> very importantly um, talking about the impacts of trauma work on the staff who are supporting youth so that will be uh, module one and two Ashley and I will cover today and uh, uh, Marilyn and Deborah will cover the second tomorrow. So why think trauma? How we uh, explain behavior usually predicts how we're going to handle it. So if you think of an example, like you're driving um, down the road and someone cuts you off in a way that's dangerous, in a way uh, that makes your heart uh, skip a beat, right? And you might be compelled uh, to look out the window and kind of shake your fist at them or get really upset. Um, but imagine then the person driving by makes it very obvious that the person next to them is pregnant, they're uh, getting ready to have a baby, and that will change likely how we respond, right? We might move over so uh, to give them the go ahead to, go, uh, to move on past us and um, feel a little bit differently about uh, that situation. And the same is true um, with youth and how we uh, interpret behavior can dictate how we respond to it. So we wanna make sure that we have an understanding of what it is youth have experienced so that we respond um, in a good way. And while trauma is not an excuse for behavior, it does help us begin to understand it. And the more we understand, the more we can do to alleviate some of those uh, undesired responses that we often see uh, um, contributing to uh, a youth circumstance in life. And then the more that we understand um, the impacts of trauma and what we can do about it, the uh, safer we often are in our interactions with youth for ourselves, the safer our colleagues are, and the safer, of course, that youth is um, um, as, they, as they move through their life, as they move through the program that you might be supporting them in. A few of the things we want you to walk away from to with from today with is the ability to describe uh, and define trauma and how that differs from um, stress, typical kind of common everyday stressors. We hope that by the end you'll be able to view uh, tr view behaviors that youth experience, view behaviors that colleagues may um, express through that trauma lens with a specific focus on um, a resilience lens, right? We don't always want it to be about what a person has experienced, but also what um, that that's negative, but also what they have uh, going for them. What are their strengths? What are their strengths within themselves? What are their strengths that they come uh, to the program with that from their family and their ancestors and what are the strengths that the community has uh, to wrap around them. And of course we want uh, you to have a better understanding of how we can build these resilience factors to buffer against some of the impacts uh, that trauma um, wants to have on a person. So what is a potentially traumatic event? And before I launch into this, I'd like you each, if you wouldn't mind, to think about a youth that you work with, that you support, that's important in your life. And as we move through this content today, um, and as Marilyn and, and Deb finish it up tomorrow, I'd like you to reflect um, the information you're learning back um, onto that youth that you're supporting. So as we move through this, I'll prompt you a few times to think about what that youth has experienced, think about some of the effects they might have um, as a result of the, the stories that they have. And um, so I'd like you to just take one minute here and, and think about a youth that, that's important to you, that you work with professionally, that you support personally, um, and have them in the back of your mind as we move through uh, the rest of today's training and as you participate in tomorrow's training, if you, you choose to. Um, but there's, um, 
kind of these three E's of a trauma exposure. And this definition was developed by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. And they really work to construct this definition with the support of folks who have experienced trauma and have healed from their trauma or continuing to heal from their trauma. So the first is events. And that's the exposure to actual, um, actual or perceived threat to their safety. So um, it can be something that a person experiences directly. It can be something they, that uh, might not be happening to them, but they're a direct witness to. It could be something that they uh, learn happens to a close family uh, member or loved one, right? So the event doesn't have to, have to happen to us. It can happen to someone really important to us, and we can experience that as, as traumatic. And of course, it can also happen when we are exposed to the trauma stories um, of youth we work with or uh, different clients if we work with adults, when we're exposed to those trauma stories on a regular basis, uh, we can um, experience that as secondary trauma, which is a very real uh, form of trauma. How we make meaning or the experience we have um, as a result of those events differs from person to person. Two people can experience the same thing and, and one may respond in a way that suggests the event was very traumatic to them and the other may not. And that's based on a lot of things that we'll talk about over the next couple of days. But I want, I want you all to think about their histories, right? Is this the first kind of uh, traumatic experience the, the youth has had or is it is it one that has um, compounded on several others that they've experienced over the last year or perhaps their whole childhood? And what protective factors are around them to help buffer them against um, some of the events that they've gone through and help them process what that was like afterwards. So um, everybody makes meaning of things um, in different ways. And lastly, a traumatic event has effects. These effects can be uh, immediate and they can also be delayed, but most often they fall into um, the categories of physical effects, right? So our immune system might be suppressed. We might um, not be able to, uh, we might uh, start to experience um, uh, more colds because of that, um, more general sickness. We might have a hard time sleeping or um, getting the rest that we need. Sometimes the uh, the effects are uh, impact us socially. So we may begin to isolate. We may uh, stop associating with people that uh, used to bring us strength and joy. There are emotional impacts and spiritual impacts as well. And I think a key piece to remember is that you might not see these right away, um, but that they can um, present themselves later on as a youth does, as a youth begins to process what, um, what they have experienced. And so throughout this training, we're going to provide you with some concrete things you can do to support youth who have experienced um, trauma. And the two important steps are to really uh, ask ourselves whether youth has been exposed to trauma and how they might have, how that Im exposure impacts their experiences. So um, here's a few tangible things you can do, right? Reflect on that youth you just started thinking about a few minutes ago and ask yourselves, what, what have they experienced within their past? What are those stories that they bring um, when they come into contact with you and in whatever capacity that is? And then ask yourselves, how, how are they, um, what sort of impacts, effects are you seeing as a result that may be connected to, not necessarily a direct result, but may be connected to some of those earlier exposures to trauma that they have had? So we have some statistics here to share with you about trauma, specifically in youth who are involved in the juvenile justice system. So this says 93% of uh, juvenile uh, offenders reported at least one or more traumatic experience, but on average are reporting at least six or more. And the thing we know about adverse childhood experiences um, is that our, the risk rate, the um, the ratio that a person um, is more likely to experience a negative impact goes up with the number of traumatic events a person has experienced. So um, to experience six increases their risk of having some of these physical, social, emotional, cognitive impacts and spiritual impacts as a result of what they've gone through. 
So this is a, a chart here to show you they, they interviewed um, 658 adolescents that were across a range of different juvenile justice settings um, who'd been referred for, to trauma treatment. And what they asked were what sort of um, past potentially traumatic experiences have you had? And so you can see uh, down the line, the various ones that, that those youth who are involved in juvenile justice as well um, as involved in trauma treatment had experienced. So if you look at kind of some of those that fall within the middle, you see things like physical assault, sexual abuse, um, the exposure to community violence, but if you look to the left of the graph, or at least it's on my left, the one that uh, is reported highest, um, the most common experience for youth and juvenile justice settings was the experience of traumatic loss. So that repeated loss of loved ones, that repeated loss of people that they know within their community as being the, um, the highest reported adversity that youth had experienced. So I think it's important to review why, why these impacts to trauma, right? And a lot of it has to do with our brain and body chemistry. So when a person is exposed, this is a youth, this is an adult, this is anyone, when a person is exposed to a traumatic event, their bodies prepare for action. So what happens is, is our brain is interpreting the information quickly and it's preparing us to fight the trauma, to flee from the trauma, or to freeze slash disassociate from what's going, the trauma that's going on around us. And so what will happen is the heart rate uh, will increase, right? Our hearts start pounding faster. That makes our blood pressure go higher. Um, our, our systems, our body systems communicate with one another to say, release adrenaline, release, release cortisol, which are all hormones that are preparing us to act, to get bold, to get brave, to do uh, what we need to do to preserve our own safety. And things like our digestion slows down, our immune system shut down because uh, more often than not to preserve safety, it's less like our body understands it's less important to be digesting that burrito we just ate. It's more important that um, our muscles get tense, that our uh, breathing rate is increased so that we are prepared to physically respond however we need to, to preserve our safety. Um, and I should say that this response is healthy and normal and does keep us safe. It becomes problematic when someone's uh, exposed to these events that cause this reaction in our body in a, in, a, in a compounded, repeated, and chronic way. Because then what happens is our brains and our bodies get really good at assuming danger, whether we're truly in danger or not. So a little bit about the brain uh, science behind all of this. And I will say that this is um, kind of a, a limited broad strokes overview of what's going on um, within our brain. And so while our body will respond in the way I just described on the previous slide, kind of uh, unconsciously, um, there, are, there are some conscious awareness pieces that our brain is interpreting and coding for us so that we can remember it in the future and control and to make sure that we can stay safe if this sort of thing were to happen to us again. So first, the information that a person receives about what's threatening most often comes from the five senses, right? So what we hear, what we smell, what we see, what we taste, what we can touch and feel. Um, and those are encoded by our brain and understanding what type of sensory information that a youth is taking in will help us understand what is making them feel threatened. So we'll talk about triggers in a moment, but when we see youth really responding and perhaps it's in the cafeteria, it might be the smell of a certain type of food that's being made that triggers them back into a moment uh, that happened to them uh, routinely at the dinner table when a parent and what was always on the table was grilled cheese or what was always on the table was the smell of tomato soup, whatever it might be. This um, second bit is this information is processed by our brain and it's very important to understand which part of the brain is processing um, the information at different points during the ex experience. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the survival brain versus the learning brain. And the survival brain is the consists of the limbic system and it's responsible for many of our initial emotional responses that are linked to spotting danger. Um, so the amygdala there is in red and it's holding on to memories about danger in the past. 
And those memories are held within the hippocampus in yellow and screening which information goes to the learning brain, which is represented by the thalamus and teal, um, the, the, the hippo, excuse me, the hippocampus in yellow is what uh, screens that information. And then the learning brain is really that, that purple part, on, um, the front part of the brain, um, which helps us, it's, it's the, uh, part of the brain that's responsible for higher order thinking. So problem solving, impulse control, um, being able to weigh information and make decisions to uh, be future oriented and, and um, kind of create plans for what you need to do to get to that future you're envisioning. Um, and so what happens is, is our survival brain takes over, uh, which is often referred to as the back part of our brain. The survival brain takes over when we are threatened and it becomes very hard for the front part of our brain to process information information accurately and make decisions based on what's in front of us. So what we can do as providers, as those who work with youth, um, is to create environments as best as we can where, where youth aren't being triggered into that back part of their brain. So they have access to um, growing and developing um, that front part of the brain, which takes a long time to develop anyway with completely healthy development, right? It's the last part of our brains to develop um, and it requires kind of uh, continual learning and continual experience to be really able to exercise and grow that part. So talking about establishing safety, um, what can we do to help youth gain physical and psychological safety? And this is what where I'm going to pose a question to you all. What are things you do to help tell a youth that, you, that they are physically safe, that you are going to help keep them physically safe? What are some of those things that we do? And go ahead and chat box them in if you wouldn't mind. I hope you all can see, you'll have to select panelists and attendees so I can see it too. Um, let them know I'm here for them, yeah. a space that makes them feel comfortable, absolutely. What they tell me is confidential, that's so good. Give them my phone number, I'm present, I listen. Encouraging dialogue. Yes, you guys are going right to the next bit, which is psychological safety. And I love that, that we're seeing this validate feelings, uh, telling them the truth, even if it's, if it's uh, you know, not like what they wanna hear, giving positive feedback or compliments a culturally welcoming space and checking in daily. Those are awesome. So when we talk about creating safety, we often talk about twofold, creating physical safety. So how do we know, how do we tell them, how do we create an environment where they know they're physically safe? Yes, the doors lock at night. Yes, someone is here to make sure you're safe if you need anything in the middle of the night. Um, we are going to make you wear your seatbelt every time you get in the car. Some of those things that are physically safe. Um, but we often forget pieces connected to psychological safety, except you all, because all of those are great examples of psychological safety. What are those things we do um, verbally, non-verbally, and things we create in the environment to let a youth know that their feelings are valid, that we're here to listen to them, that we're going to keep things confidential and not share their business when it doesn't need to be, and it's not, you know, it doesn't create a threat to their safety, right? It's not necessarily about child abuse or neglect that needs to be reported, um, but all of those things where a youth feel like they're in a space that they can share what they're feeling without the threat of retaliation, without the threat that we're going to shame them or invalidate what they're experiencing because it's not what we would experience. And really, truly, sometimes when uh, people are have experienced a lot of trauma, their understanding of what has happened can be skewed because that survival brain is going off, right? They're not, they're not so much in the front part of their brain really critically thinking and analyzing their current situation. Their body has gotten really efficient at responding to uh, one stimulus, right? One thing they smell, one thing they heard, one thing they saw and making uh, inferences based on that information. So anything we can do to kind of validate and help explain why they might be feeling that way and listening to, to what their explanations are as an, are excellent ways to create that psychological safety. Okay. Um, creating predictability and balancing firmness with caring, right? I often think, um, 
we say a lot uh, when when folks are getting nervous that they might say the wrong thing that that it's pretty true across the board that people won't always remember exactly what you said, but will remember how you made them feel. So when we're uh, implementing boundaries and when we're providing structure, there's that piece of how do you do that with care and how do you do that uh, with attention to what their emotional experiences are in those moments. So one of the best strategies um, this curriculum talks about for implementing a trauma-informed approach uh, to creating is creating a trauma-informed safety plan. And I think this can look like many different things depending on uh, your environment, uh, depending on the program that you are supporting youth in. Um, but this is one of the recommendations for for having a structured way to really partner with a youth to create. Um, a plan that all the providers and folks that work with that uh, uh, that youth are aware of so so that everyone's on the same page. And so a few of the things that uh, they suggest to include within a safety plan are a brief trauma history. So often this is collected by like a clinician or a counselor that the youth is working with that might know those more intimate details of their past. But it's helpful to know what a youth has experienced so that we can try, so that we know what conversations we might walk into and so that we might know what to avoid uh, to limit us uh, reminding them of that uh, of that trauma in a way that their body uh, goes into autopilot responding in that kind of visceral way when we're when we're say playing basketball right when it's not the space to um, to be able to process through some of those events. I would also say with a brief trauma history, it's really important that we know what resilience factors exist around that youth within themselves that are like innate to their core personality, but also within their families and their extended networks. And then what exists within the community that will help um, support them and, and build them up. It's helpful to know trauma reminders. So what, what are the things that they've experienced that they um, know kind of take them back into that place? And we'll talk more in detail about what those are and what they can look like in a minute. And what are what are some warning signs that, uh, that a youth might be learning losing control? It's helpful when they contribute to this as well, right? We want to know from them, what does it feel like when you're starting to uh, get upset? What does it look like when you're starting to want to isolate? Can you identify some things that are like early warning signs, right? Do you get hot? Do you get scattered? Is it hard for you to think? Do you get um, kind of dots it like black spots in your eyes um do you feel really tired do you want to cry what are some of those things that are early warning signs um that within a short amount of time you uh they might lose control in whatever way that looks like for them and then we want to be able to come up with different uh strategies that work for the youth right often generated by the youth to help um help them regulate themselves before um losing control right before their bodies take over into that kind of fight flight or freeze mode and so that can look like many different things and it's often uh, it's best to develop with uh, the youth alongside so you're not just guessing at what will be helpful but it could be listening to music it could be having space and quiet time in their room if they're stimulated overstimulated by the noise that's going on um, in like the milieu of a group setting. Uh, it might be connecting one-on-one -on -one with an adult to talk about what's going on. It could be uh, drawing, it could be beating. They may need to smudge, whatever that might be. We wanna know what those things are that help the youth and write them into a plan so that when the next person uh, meets and interacts with that youth, they have the same information and that youth can predictably know that their needs are gonna get met regardless if they're working with Ashley or Laura that makes sense. So just curious, um, do your the programs that you work with and support youth um, have any sort of safety plans that they put into place? Maybe not necessarily with these kind of key outlined pieces, but um, plans that they co-develop with, with the youth they're working with um, to help them? You want to just chat box in a little bit uh, about what those plans are and what they include. I think it's also always helpful to see what others are doing out there um, to support uh, the kids that they're working with and see if there's crossover that might be helpful in another place. Thank you. 
couple minutes there. This is Stacy says they help them write up a plan and they have it in their treatment plan. Yeah. That's great. I think it's a fairly common practice. I think uh, some of the things I always think of um, as being like, just like vital to their success, right, is how, how they get developed, right, like with, with the youth. And it sounds like, Stacy, that's what you do. You help them write up a plan um, so that they have some autonomy and control over it, but also who knows them better than themselves, right? Um, and so, so I think that that can, is just such an important piece to that. Um, we talk about safe places to go if needed and let them know if they need to talk, we're here and we care. Absolutely. Yeah. And then just using these plans as like living, breathing documents, right? Something that um, the youth knows exists, something that gets revisited at times as they, uh, you know, as different things happen and life goes on and maybe they have found another coping skill that uh, they would benefit from having added to their plans. Yeah. Right. Thank you all for sharing those. I think um, it's just good to hear what others are doing out there. So trauma reminders and triggers, what are those, right? We all have these. Our, when we talk about kind of that, that brain uh, science piece of how we interpret information, how we feel, how uh, our five senses contribute to how memories are stored and what we feel when uh, we're taken back to that place where uh, the memory first happened, right? I think oftentimes we talk about, think about that song, right? Um, and and if it, that song that's yours, that it means uh, a lot to you because of where you were at in your life, 10 years go by and you hear that song, it still most of the time takes you right back to where you were when you heard it. Um, and so that is true of traumatic events as well. So things, events, situations, places, sensation um, can unconsciously and consciously trigger people back into that fight, flight, or freeze response. So it uh, most often it's connected to the senses, right? How something uh, tastes, how something smells, what it looks like, what it feels like, those sorts of things. But what happens is, is their body inter gets that stimulus and interprets uh, and, and its brain goes through the process of saying, you were in danger the last time this happened. Respond as though you're in danger now to protect yourself. But when you look at the current moment that it's going on, the context might say this youth's not in danger at all, right? We're just, um, the kids are just playing basketball. But because someone got thrown to the ground, that image sent that youth right back into a time and space in their life where they were exposed to violence and it did threaten their safety or it did threaten the safety of someone that they cared deeply of. Um, and when we talk about trauma reminders, we do so to, to say they're everywhere around us um, and that we can, by knowing a youth's history, we can often uh, try to limit the number of triggers that, um, that exist within their environment. So if we know if we know family violence is part of their history, we might want to limit some of the things that we do where uh, a youth can interpret a scene as as, as violent and take them back into that moment. So it could be the movies that, that um, they're able to watch. It could be wh whether, um, you know, they're, they're able to participate in the wrestling match, whatever it might be, we can remove some of those, those triggers that uh, we know are likely to take them back to those places. But it's also true to say we unconsciously and unintentionally trigger people all the time because they are so uh, unique to a person's story and what they've gone through. So a couple things to do to calm that survival brain to get folks from the back part of their brain where their fight, flight, and free fight, <laughs> flight, where they're fighting, fleeing, or freezing, and more towards that front part of their brain where they're building relationships, creating connections, problem solving, thinking things through, um, is to work on calming that sur survival brain. Um, 
and really just some of our natural reactions to how youth behave are based on our own survival brain because some of that behavior we might often interpret as like disrespect or being rude or not uh, listening uh, and following the directions of authority. And that's often a trigger from our own survival brain. So just remember, um, that youth affected by trauma often expect people to compromise their safety. They're, they have learned that that is the pattern of, of the world, that adults aren't safe, that the world is not safe around them. And we have to work to really rewrite that script, um, that they will try uh, to feel safe and protect themselves in ways that are risky or destructive, right? So they might get into an altercation because getting big and getting aggressive is what's protected them in the past. It just doesn't make sense sense necessarily in a classroom setting, right? But their, their brains have responded as though it does. And then of course that, that youth can learn new ways um, to feel safe and that we can start to rewire some of these natural um, pathways that the brain takes when a youth has been exposed to chronic trauma. Some of these pathways can be rewired when they are in an environment where um, the adults around them are safe, where they are valid, their feelings are valid validated, where they are able to um, share what they've been through and have someone um, respond in a safe and healthy way. So we create new pathways all the time in how our brain operates. And so I think that that's uh, really important that as much as some of these reactions that we see youth have are really intrinsic um, because of of uh, what they've experienced in their young lives, um, that we can also, that it's also very possible and probable to rewire some of those things so that they uh, don't assume danger um, at every corner. Okay. So there are different ways that youth respond to traumatic stress reactions. Um, these up here we'll talk about um, in more detail, but they're really broken down um, by the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and that is often what occurs when that uh, survival brain is activated. So we'll break each of these down. So when we talk about re-experiencing, that's most often intrusive thoughts about images, um, sounds, the feelings that were associated with that event that they've gone through. And they come into the mind uncontrollably. It can happen when they're sleeping. It might be nightmares. It can happen in um, kind of the daydreaming that, that we do like in a classroom setting or a training setting, right? Uh, is that repeated, chronic, unwanted, unwelcomed replaying of the events that have that have happened uh, to a person? And a lot of times, when we're replaying those events, a youth might be replaying them in a way that they uh, change the outcome of the story, right? They rewrite it so that what happened that that the person didn't get. Um, hurt that ended up getting hurt, that justice was served, whatever it might be. Oops, oh dear. Sorry about that, you all. Abby, could you get me back into presenter mode? The buttons are a little too small. Thank you, I'm sorry about that. So there are avoidance symptoms connected to uh, uh, trauma, and they are simply a symptom of what has, has occurred. So it might be that avoidance of, of the feelings that were connected to that event. Um, it can be internal and external. So um, we might avoid coming into contact with certain people. We might avoid going to certain places or objects that remind us of that event. Um, Substance use is often a form of avoidance, right? It works for a period of time to not think about um, the events that have happened, to not feel the feelings associated with, with what's gone on. Um, there might be complaints, like uh, we call them somatic complaints, right? My stomach hurts, I'm not feeling well. Um, I have a headache in an attempt to avoid having to go to school, having to uh, where, where the traumatic event might have taken place, having to uh, leave the home where they feel safe, where something traumatic may occur outside the home. So we often see that. You might see oppositional behavior um, and you might see a youth unwilling to um, talk about what they've, what they've gone through as a means of avoiding um, some of that pain. 
So there are alterations in arousal and reactivity as well. We've heard this described a lot as being um, on the balls of your feet. There's a trauma expert, his name's Carl uh, Bell, and he talks about that constantly being on the balls of your feet, ready to react, ready to respond, ready to keep yourself or your loved ones safe. And what it can look like are some of these things, uh, being self-destructive or reckless. It can look like being quick to startle, not being able to sleep, uh, just um, having troubles con uh, concentrating on the what's going on, like say in the classroom or what's going on in a one-on-one -on -one, uh conversation because they're so focused on assessing safety, assessing risk throughout everything in the environment that's coming at them. Um, you might see, yep, I'll stop that there. So there can be negative alterations in cognition and mood as well. So that might be the inability to remember important aspects of the event. Um, they, they can call it uh, dissociative amnesia, and it's not necessarily uh, due to a head injury or substance use, right? It's our brain um, taking out the information that is too hard to remember, right? Pervasive uh, negative emotional states, like constantly being a, in a state of fear or horror, guilt or shame. It's an inability to experience some of those positive emotions like joy, like excitement. Um, so it's really just kind of staying um, numb to the experiences going on that you're having and the emotional responses that you're having. You uh, often see people talk about not having um, interest in doing some of the things that they like to do, connecting with people they used to like to connect with. Um, and can often include um, kind of exaggerated response, emotional responses to things, exaggerated ways of feeling about yourself, right? I, um, nothing in the world ever goes my way. I'm a bad kid. Some of those conversations um, and thought processes are often simply a symptom of the trauma they've experienced and that alteration in their uh, mood and cognition. So disassociation, um, it's when a youth separates themselves from the experience so much so it's like they've checked out, right? So uh, it can look like um, not listening. It can look like being forgetful. It can, um, especially in situations where you, uh, when someone's been told something multiple times, it can look like almost active defiance, but really what it is, is a youth has emotionally and mentally uh, checked out in a way that they don't have to experience the, um, the hurt and the pain connected to their trauma experiences. But in doing that, it's hard for them to tune in. So they've gotten good at tuning out, but their ability to tune in um, is limited because uh, they've gotten so good at tuning out. So here are a few more statistics. Um, we, this is the first one we already visited, but that, uh, on average, um, youth in detention centers were reporting at least six trauma exposures early in life. Um, and then talking about uh, rates of post-traumatic stress um, and juvenile justice involved youth uh, mimicking those as uh, uh, active duty uh, uh, service members returning from Iraq. Um, and then talking about how 40% of youth um, with trauma history are diagnosed with uh, a um, mental health disorder. So why does it matter, right? When we talk about um, identifying risk, right? We're looking at determining the likelihood that uh, a youth is going to re-offend re or um, experience some of the same, I should say, participate in some of the same behavior that has brought them to your program in the first place. And that helps us when we understand what a youth has gone through, we're able to uh, create programs and, and tailor services so that they're able to um, meet that use underlying, that use underlying need uh, versus uh, kind of simply be a, a menu of things provided to a child. Um, that's getting at the need, right? We're able to match those specific services to what that youth needs. And we're maximizing those services to 
um, build on the strengths that already exist within themselves, within their families and within their extended community um, so that they're supported and so that they're able to do some healing and find new ways of being and new ways of existing to be present in, um, in the world that they're in um, and to feel safe uh, from some of the things they've experienced from happening again. Here are some quick statistics. So, um, this is looking at rates of mental health disorders um, in, in youth uh, and juvenile detention centers. Um, and so you'll see things like uh, substance use disorders and disruptive disorders like oppositional defiance and conduct disorder are listed fairly high, but right behind it um, are anxiety disorders and mood disorders. And that's simply to say that there is crossover um, with mental health and uh, trauma. And we know that um, when youth have mental health uh, uh, disorders connected to mental health um, diagnoses, I should say, connected to them, you're often working with a team of people. There are often mental health providers, uh, could be case managers, it could be uh, folks uh, doing medication management um, and general case management, and that we understand there are some barriers to working across the different professions that, that um, connect with an individual youth. And I think, again, that speaks to when those uh, safety plans can be so helpful in bringing a team of people onto the same page about what a youth's experienced, uh, what are some things to avoid uh, that we can do to avoid triggering them, and what are some of the coping skills that help uh, them come back to a place of calm. And yeah. Okay. And when we talk about building uh, resilience, some of the things we wanna look to build or look to enhance when they're already there are self-efficacy, that thought that if I put my mind to something, I am going to accomplish it, I will get it done. The self-esteem, I have value and worth as a person simply just because I am. Um, competence, that, that I can learn something new, that I'm an expert in something, that I can, um, get good at what, what's in front of me if I want to, whether that's like academic or uh, at like a sport or um, whatever it might be. And that spiritual belief, that connection to something other than yourself, right? There's something bigger than me out there um, that has a plan or that things happen for a reason. Some of those spiritual values that we have um, are absolutely a, uh, uh, asset to a person. And then the various resources we'd be wanting to explore are what family support exists, what peer support exists, their connections within the community um, to programs, but also just to community events and their connection to schools are some of the strongest predictors of, um, of youth healing from what they've experienced. And so our goal when using uh, kind of a trauma responsive rep rep approach is to build on resilience and move uh, to a place where youth aren't just surviving what they've gone through, but really thriving in spite of it. So some everyday things you can do, right? The behavior might be in front of you, but it's not about you. Letting them know that what they've gone through is painful, that it wasn't okay, that, um, whatever they're feeling about it is their feelings and that's truth, that, that's, that's their experience. Um, helping them understand um, that some of their behaviors are simply a reaction to what their brain is telling them to do, which is to protect themselves. That we can, we can also work to avoid those unnecessary triggers and we can invite youth into the conversation about what's going to best help them um, and, in the moment, what's going to best help them prepare for the future and what is best going, going to help them connect uh, to the people that they need to connect to uh, um, in their various um, kind of circles. Okay. So when we understand that trauma is the root of many of, of, many of the things that we see, um, you're able to manage behaviors that you're seeing more effectively. Um, the environment that, that youth are part of will become more positive. Everyone will feel safer, including yourself and the youth. Um, and, and ultimately, 
reduce kind of the number of um, incidents that that occur that jeopardize safety that um, kind of put a youth kind of backwards, if you will, within the program. Um, and so the biggest thing I think we can do is really focus on uh, calming that uh, survival brain, right? Using those approaches that you talked about to um, to uh, create some of that psychological safety. So, so youth are more able to exist in um, the learning brain um, and less time uh, figuring out how, how to survive their interactions and their days. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Ashley. Thanks, Laura. We did have one question come into the chat um, and it says, can Laura talk a little bit about the fawn response to trauma? It's not necessarily always included in the discussions of reactions to trauma, but I think it's a really important response to which to be aware. So Laura, I don't know if you have any thoughts to share there. Laura, can you still hear me? Yes, sorry about that. Am I back on? Yes. Yeah, so I think, so, um, yeah, I, I want to work on my response and I don't want to take too much, uh, Ashley, of your time. But yeah, we hear about that a lot and we hear about it a lot um, in uh, that reaction to kind of, um, oh, I don't even know how to, how to really expand. When we think of like childhood trauma and uh, the connection to the caregiver. So if the caregiver is responsible for the harm and, and um, but also is that child's caregiver that need to want to make things okay, to problem solve, to smooth things over is a very common response when we see that intimate connection between the, um, the, the victim or the person who has been harmed um, and the person who perpetrated that harm. So we also see that um, in situations of family violence as well, where there's, where the dynamics are just so complicated um, because there is so much love there and there is a perception of how the relationship should look like and then what what is going on and how uh, complicated that, that can be. Um, I'm going to work on my response and chat response it to you as well to give Ashley some time to get going here. Thanks so much. All right, we're going to um, keep moving us along and we're going to build on the information that Laura provided us in module one and talk a little bit more about how we understand trauma's impact to development. Um, so one of the main goals of this module is to understand how trauma um, uh, impacts the ways in which youth grow up um, and who they grow up to be. So particular focus, uh, we're going to talk some specifically about the impact of multiple traumatic experiences. So I'll be talking a, a little bit about complex trauma um, and how those experiences um, impact important developmental tasks and competencies. So we'll take a look at trauma's impact on a few different components of a youth's, life, youth's lives, um, including attachment and relationships, adolescent development tasks, tasks and competencies, um, and then describe a little bit about how trauma can derail developmental progression. So we're going to um, come back really briefly to our understanding of trauma. And so here are the three E's again to help us define trauma. It's the events, experiences, and effects. Um, and trauma really refers to um, events that people experience as extremely harmful um, or life-threatening and potentially has both either short or long-time harmful effects on the person. And as Laura mentioned, it really is the person's perception of the event um, that we want to be attuned to. So it could be that two individuals experience a very similar traumatic event, maybe the same exact event, and one person um, you know, comes out of that and, and doesn't exhibit any post-traumatic stress type symptoms and then another person does. And there are lots of factors that contribute to why that might be. 
One of those can be the age of youth. So younger ch children often have um, fewer coping skills, less ability to make meaning out of their experience. Um, so it could be that a young child, um, when experiencing trauma, the greater they have greater potential um, that the trauma impacts their development and ability to cope again, because they may not have words, for example, or understanding to make sense of what it is that they experienced. Another factor is um, the impact of uh, tr someone's trauma history. So we know that um, the impact of trauma is cumulative. And with each traumatic experience, a youth's coping resource resources can be further depleted. Um, so for example, maybe a child was um, physically abused and, um, and witnessed domestic violence but managed to function well enough. And then they experience a violent assault at age 18, for example, and that might bring back some of those earlier experiences and can overwhelm a youth's ability to cope. So um, thinking about complex trauma and the ways in which some of those experiences can compound on each other is one way for us to, to understand um, right, what the impact of those experiences can be on any particular youth. Um, another factor to consider is trauma at the hands of caregivers. So um, uh, trauma at the hands of caregivers, especially when it begins early in life and goes on for a long time can be especially damaging. And this kind of trauma often interferes with a child's ability uh, to accomplish some key developmental tasks. So for example, um, learning to trust adults, right? Learning to understand that adults should be there to, um, to protect us. And so any type of intimate relationship can cause stress um, if they have experienced in childhood, for example, trauma at the hands of a particular caregiver. And so that would be another factor that we would want to be mindful of. And then secondary adversity. So what follows after trauma can have a really significant impact on a child's recovery. Um, and the challenges they face after trauma are called secondary adversity. So an example that we often provide is Think about, for example, the children um, who experienced uh, Hurricane Katrina. They not only suffered those immediate traumatic impacts of the storm, but some of those secondary adversities. So um, being deprived of their homes, maybe not being able to go to school, loss of routine, right? Everything that they had associated with safety. Um, so those are some uh, considerations for understanding um, the ways in which someone's um, sort of the complexities of trauma experience and some of those factors that can impact um, the ways in which trauma then manifests in any particular, um, any particular child or youth. Okay, um, so uh, in module one, Laura really started talking about dealing with uh, threats and promoting safety with the survival brain and stress response. And we're gonna go into a little bit deeper detail about this by breaking down um, how traumatic events impact the way a child learns to protect um, him or herself. And traumatic events are filled with many moments that a child will process differently depending on how old the child is, what life experiences they've already had, um, how youth protect themselves from threats and stay safe changes based on their um, age uh, and stage of development and different life experiences. So for example, maybe a young child who sees um, his mother being treated violently by um, his father will feel very afraid. Maybe they'll hide under his bed, maybe wish for a superhero to come one day um, and save his mom from experiencing violence. But maybe a child um, who's 10 or 11, 11 in middle, um, middle childhood, maybe they feel really anxious in this particular um, situation. They go into their room and play video games really loudly, right? Turn up the music and try to, to pretend that that fight, um, the arguing, the violence isn't happening. And then an adolescent might become very angry, grab a bat to protect his mother because he views his father as cruel and out of control. So that just gives you a little sense of the ways in which age can really impact how, um, how youth respond to the threats and safety, um, safety um, threats to safety that they might be experiencing. So um, an important takeaway I think here is to, um, is, is really to um, 
understand and honor the ways in which injuries caused by traumatic events may not be evident right away. Um, they can take, um, those injuries can include negative impacts on child development and physiological changes um, that happen due to the traumatic event. Um, but similar to, um, you know, one example they often provide in this curriculum is similar to a house having a faulty foundation. The impact of these injuries will show up later if proper steps aren't taken to heal those invisible wounds um, or fix the damaged foundation. So, um, as we think about how it is we understand um, trauma, the impact of trauma to development, and more broadly as we understand um, how to become trauma-informed organizations, um, it really goes beyond just identifying traumatic events that youth have experienced and really, again, trying to understand the impacts of extensive trauma histories on how you think and feel and behave and connect to others. Um, and uh, when we talk about some of those, um, right, those uh, experiences of trauma and the many different types of trauma, again, we define this really as complex trauma, and it refers to traumatic events that are both repetitive and occur over a long period of time in a youth's life, so generally beginning at an early age. Um, could be caused by a caregiver or other trusted adult and have a significant impact on the ways in which a youth develops. So um, because we know that childhood and adolescence are times of rapid development and continuous change, uh, we know that traumatic events at any age and stage of development can impact a child's developmental accomplishments and influence how the child develops over time. I think one way we often um, think about trauma's impact is, on development is to imagine a staircase. Um, and each of those stairs, right, is a potential developmental um, milestone that we would expect of usual development. And when a child has experienced trauma, it could be that some of those stairs are missing. And so we might have an expectation that the youth is all the way on the top, right, or a particular stair based upon what we would expect of usual development. But because of the way trauma impacts um, individuals and complex trauma in particular impacts youth, um, then we would want to take that into account as we are crafting a system or services um, that best meets the, the needs of each, each youth's really individual experience. Um, and so we know that complex trauma has the capacity to impact um, multiple developmental domains, including attachment and relationships, um, their biology and, um, and the ways in which they develop physically, their cognition, emotion regulation. Um, and we're going to take a look at some of these domains. We're not going to um, we're not going to cover them all in detail, but we will cover a little bit of them, especially how they relate to adolescent development. And um, I think, you know, an important note, and I see my colleagues have, um, or my colleagues are putting into the chat as a good reminder to you all is that because of the compressed time that we have together today, we've um, kind of create, had to, to pare down some of the information that's usually contained in this curriculum. Um, and so if you are interested in learning more about this, um, you know, getting like the full version of this particular curriculum, please let us know and um, the National Aid Children's Trauma Center can respond to, to that request. So thank you for, to my colleagues who put that reminder in the chat for us. Okay. Um, as we think about complex trauma, it often includes exposure to multiple types of violence or victimization, such as child abuse and neglect, or uh, maybe sexual abuse, bullying or cyberbullying, uh, witnessing or experiencing um, intimate partner violence, experience violence at school, community violence, terrorism. And there's a growing um, kind of collection of research that shows that the impact of this poly victimization, so um, victimization that occurs in, in a few different ways, um, can be uh, more powerful, more impactful than even multiple events of a single type. And so one such way that, that can, this can really compound a youth's experience of trauma is that it becomes challenging for youth to feel safe really in any setting, um, which can then make it challenging, right, to think about how to effectively respond if they're being um, triggered in multiple different types of settings. <clears throat> 
And of many justice-involved youth who've experienced complex trauma also experience other types of stressors and secondary adversities, which we talked a little bit about. So things like poverty or sibling conflict or um, having property stolen, right? All of these further undermine feelings of a lack of safety and can cause additional stress because um, really these events are being um, perpetuated by different people and in many different settings. And so when complex trauma um, starts um, and occurs in early life, it can really damage a use um, uh, foundation for many of the domains of development. And um, repairing that damage and promoting recovery happens when we acknowledge that that impact, we honor the complex ways in which trauma impacts the youth that we serve, and we actively work um, uh, with youth to build the skills and abilities that they may be missing because of this impact. So um, continuing to think about the ways in which complex trauma impacts the youth that we might serve, um, it can certainly have a significant impact on, on development and maintenance of healthy relationships. So adolescent survivors of trauma, especially if interpersonal traumas like abuse and neglect often experience um, many challenges in relationships. So this might be something that you've seen um, in your own work. Um, Intimate and trusting relationships can be difficult to establish or maintain uh, because again, they've, ex they've associated relationships maybe with physical and emotional harm and abandonment. Um, and this association can contribute to feelings of distrust or suspiciousness. Um, some youth might withdraw from friends and family and romantic relationships as a way of seeking um, safety and maybe that the experience of isolation is better um, in their minds, right, than being in relationship where they might experience harm. And the opposite of that can be true as well. So sometimes um, uh, young people with significant trauma can be so desirous of those close personal relationships because relationships and being in relationship is such a human need um, that they become, can become overly dependent upon peers um, or romantic partners. And this can seem um, maybe dependent and intrusive um, and fail to respect or consider appropriate boundaries of the individuals that they're trying to be in relationship with. So they might um, try to get their needs met, but perhaps not in a way that is, a, that is sustainable and honors the boundaries within a particular relationship. Um, and then for some, their experiences um, of relationships have been modeled um, where violence is, you know, kind of normal, uh, you know, a normal part of relationships. And so many youth can repeat some of that violence that they endure or witness in relationship. Um, so for youth who have experienced trauma, particularly sexual or physical abuse, their developing body, um, accompanying hormonal changes, maybe dating, you know, right, of course, it depends on the particular age of the youth. But that all can serve as a reminder of past trauma. Um, so the invisible scars that are created by the experience of trauma can really undermine positive um, body development. Um, but counter caring adults can really counter that by helping youth identify those triggers and reminders and early warning signs related to their bodies. So just as Laura spoke about um, creating a safety plan, right, being able to identify what some of those trauma triggers are, likewise focusing in on the ways in which their bodies might experience or hold those responses to trauma can be really helpful in thinking about how then to implement a safety plan that responds to that particular um, that particular reaction that could that could occur. Um, so in thinking about, for example, um, the unpredictable changes that puberty can um, increase the feelings of really being out of control. Um, some youth engage in behaviors that can be really reckless in order to seek some kind of control when their bodies are feeling really out of control. And so this might include engaging in behaviors like um, non-suicidal self-injury, right? Or maladaptive eating, or maybe um, lots of piercings or tattoos. Um, and of course, this is all dependent upon culture, right? Um, but another, um, uh, but mostly what I want to offer there is just um, thinking about the, the ways in which youth try to exert control over their bodies 
Um, and some, sometimes the ways in which those, those particular engagement strategies can be, um, can be you know, not supportive in terms of healthy development. Substance use, for example, can be one way that um, youth might attempt to control um, physical sensations that they are experiencing as a result of, of puberty. Um, and so as we learned earlier, for example, and uh, Laura talked a little bit about the chronic stress that um, can come as a result of experience complex trauma can have a significant impact um, on the stress response and lead youth to experiencing multiple somatic complaints and may increase susceptibility to illnesses. So um, again, I think Laura mentioned this, but um, right, you might see youth who just are seem to be constantly sick, right? Their bodies are kind of in overload trying to manage all of the um, all of the stress or the, the stress um, uh, responses that are happening in their body. And as a consequence, that maybe they have a decreased ability to fight off even the common cold. So you might see them have many, you know, multiple illnesses um, in a way that may not be usual for them. Okay. So in just keeping us uh, moving along in terms of understanding what, uh, how the ways in which complex trauma can impact the body, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about cognitive development. And so when we think about cognitive development, we recognize the ways in which that can mature over time. So in adolescence, um, right, especially we see lots of drastic shifts in their capacity to use and understand information. Um, they move away from really being concrete thinkers um, who think of things that they have direct contact, contact with or maybe direct knowledge of and really can think abstractly. They can imagine things that are not seen um, or experienced. Um, they're able to think about how they feel and they can think about what they're thinking. Um, they begin to observe themselves with more awareness and consider how others might perceive them. Um, and that thinking about how others perceive them plays a really big role, especially in terms of social development and can have an impact, um, a significant impact on their behavior. So as we um, think a little bit about cognition, we know that it's an important part of development because it relates to one's um, thinking processes. And when we think about cognition, we're really referring to a range of mental processes, including how we acquire information, how we store information for a short or long period of time, um, how we manipulate information. So how it is that we can use the information to complete another task and hold on to it at the same time. So just we see the, the complexity of um, what our brain can respond to really increases significantly in adolescence. Um, we can also see how we can um, right, retrieve that information um, that we maybe have learned and use it later. And to fully understand um, how to help youth um, learn, for example, executive functioning skills. So that, that higher order part of our brain and Laura talked a little bit about the ways in which trauma, um, right, is um, how our brain experiences trauma. Um, if we want to help youth who've experienced trauma really um, access that part of their brain that is responsible for higher order thinking, we need to understand how the impact of com uh, complex trauma can impact, how it can um, impact brain functioning. So complex trauma histories can lead to challenges of thinking clearly and reasoning and problem solving. And when children grow up under conditions of constant threat, all their internal resources go towards survival um, with the limbic system. So that piece here, um, taking a particularly strong role in the decision-making process. Um, so as a result, youth might struggle with, for example, um, sustaining attention because of intrusive thoughts that can interfere with learning, um, maybe having working memory impairments, meaning it's difficult to hold on to information and use it to solve problems, maybe having trauma reactions that can interfere with, for example, test taking, ability to remember learned information. Um, and being constantly on the lookout for danger can also impede their ability to focus on um, classroom classroom work. So I think we often have an expectation that youth are able to engage in classroom work and sit and be present. Um, but when they're constantly, um, you know, 
uh, scanning even subconsciously their environment for safety can really impede their ability to, to be present and to take in that information. Um, studies have shown that youth who've experienced traumatic events tend to score on average about eight points lower on IQ tests than youth without such backgrounds, though um, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean that these youth are less intel intelligent or less capable. It's just that they are challenged in meeting their full potential because their brains are not free to focus just on learning, right? They're scanning, again, their environment for, um, for potential, um, potential danger. And when discussing trauma, one of the most important uh, functions of both the survival and learning brain is dealing with danger from the outside world. So um, we call this sort of the danger apparatus. And the danger apparatus is always um, working to keep us safe, protected, ready for action by coordinating our entire body to go into flight flight freeze or as one of our pan or as one of our um, audience members um, suggested fawn right so this danger their danger apparatus is working overdrive um, for youth especially in youth who've experienced complex trauma and so um, just being mindful about that and the ways in which it can impact for example performance in school or tasks that we might give to the youth and the expectation of of completing those tasks is all going to be um, uh, you know, a, a, a factor in considering um, the ability to achieve those um, things that will be impacted by the experience of, of trauma in the brain. So I think one of the most um, really uh, profound impacts of trauma on the brain is um, its disruption of important developmental tasks related to decision making. Um, so our executive functioning skills um, help us control impulses and problem solve and plan for the future. And these skills um, are developing over time and are like a muscle and we, we don't have an opportunity to use those um, muscles, um, then the, the more challenging it is then to have those well developed later into adulthood. So one of the main reasons decision making can become difficult is because the survival brain again is constantly activating trying to protect from real and also just perceived danger that might be in the um, environment. So this can lead to patterns of thinking that situations are always dangerous or they're always threatening um, and they might you know more so than they actually are and so they might you might see youth making decisions based upon that particular assumption right that their environment is always um, more dangerous than maybe it really is and this is adaptive right this is this is that's an adaptive response it's um, oftentimes we I'm sure you all have examples of the ways in which youth have really sophisticated coping mechanisms that serve them very well um, in uh, situations and contexts of danger and sometimes then don't serve them very well when they are removed from that particular environment and they're asked to do um, things that you know again make things like making decisions that uh, remove from the context, context of that dangerous um, environment um, may not fully right make sense may not serve them very well. So while trauma can lead youth to have less trust, the good news is that youth whose development has been derailed by trauma can learn new ways of thinking and relating and responding to others. Just as Laura mentioned in her section, right, the brain and youth is still developing, 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 excuse me, um, into well into um, you know young adulthood, and so there is possibility for rewiring some of those pathways. There is possibility for growth and change um, within the brain, um, and so in partnership with youth and family providers and the community, we can help retain, retrain their brain through positive new experiences and examples. So I um, wanted to just pose these questions here, and we're probably not going to be able to spend a significant amount of time sort of sinking into them, but just wanted to pose them here for you all to think about, and, you know, Laura asked you to identify a youth um, that you might work with as you're thinking through this content. And I'd encourage you to think about what might be the impact of um, trauma on that particular youth's relationships, right? On their relationships with family or the relationships with you or other care providers or maybe teachers. Um, what's the impact of trauma on their physical and cognitive development? 
Um, and knowing all of this, how is it that you work to build trust with your youth? And I actually would love to see um, if you have examples of how you are doing that, how, you know, what your, you know, your process is, how you engage in relationships with youth. Um, please feel free to put those in the chat and I'm going to keep rolling with content, but um, would love for you all to share so that you can see, I'm sure, the creative ideas um, that you all have, um, that you're engaging with in your work. So how, how is it that you build trust with your youth? That's a question. Feel free to put your responses in the chat. Okay, um, so role play things. Um, as a way of orienting us to the content, we have spent some time discussing complex trauma and its impact to physical, relational, cognitive development. We're gonna turn now and talk a little bit about emotional and behavioral development and the experience and the ways in which trauma can, um, complex trauma can influence that usual development. So we know that um, in adolescence, maturation of the brain um, can improve executive functioning ability, um, especially or particularly when healthy relationships are supportive. Um, and they're using those in, in the context of those relationships, um, we're supporting the use of those executive functioning um, skills. Um, youth's increased emotional regulation can support their ability to control impulses, have greater behavior regulation, um, and develop healthier behaviors to deal with the problems that they might experience um, in, in, right, as they're moving through life. So I think importantly, when youth have experienced complex trauma, it's really um, important to remember that they often have limited ex experiences identifying a range um, of emotions in themselves and in others. So it's, if, it's as if they have the trial size crayon box, right? Um, so this, this is the, the small size crayon box that you might get, for example, when you go um, to, um, right to a restaurant. Instead, um, they may know, for example, um, so maybe they know, for example, um, happy, sad, and angry, and thus re they respond uh, based upon this limited scope of emotional understanding instead of having kind of the full range, right, the full size crayon box of emotions to choose from, such as joy and calm and frustrated. Um, and youth can often internalize or maybe even externalize some of those stress uh, reactions and as a result can experience significant depression and anxiety or anger and their emotional responses can be unpredictable or explosive because they've perceived um, chronic threat and lack of safety. And I think also important to really unpack our understanding of anger, given it's one of the kind of the primary emotions that we often see youth, especially who are maybe involved in the juvenile justice system, describe, right? The problem is that youth often don't have a clear understanding of what some of that true emotion that underlies um, their anger can be. So um, as a person, young person develops the skill though to think about their emotions, they're also able, able to perceive the, the complex gradation, right? The complexities that exist within our a range of uh, what we can experience in terms of our emotions. Um, and as helping adults, right, we can help them modify their responses. So, um, right, maybe a youth experiences mom's supposed to come for a visit and um, she's not able to come because something happens, right, her car breaks down and the youth gets really angry and they flip chairs or maybe they act out aggressively and, um, right, trying to think about holding space for that youth and really understanding what's at the, the core of that, right? Maybe disappointment and sadness. Um, and so being able to talk with them about what's really underlying some of those, um, some of that initial anger can help them build their understanding of the complexities of their emotion. And youth emotional responses can be expressed behaviorally in ways that appear unpredictable and oppositional, volatile, extreme. A youth who feels powerless or who grew up fearing an abusive authority figure can um, react defensively and aggressively in response to perceived blame or attack. Um, or alternatively, maybe they feel are, are, are really controlled or rigid and unusually compliant. I think that's something we talked a little bit about and um, thinking through the, the flight, fee, flee, freeze, or fawn response. 
Um, and these responses, again, were um, uh, whether defensive or compliant or were designed to be protective, right? And so youth who've experienced trauma can re misread situations as threatening um, and respond and behaviorally in a way that they assume or in that moment would have kept them safe, but um, doesn't work as well when they're outside of the context of that particular environment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <coughs> So uh, trauma's impact on youth behaviors, um, things like, uh, <coughs> excuse me, making realistic appraisals of danger and safety, um, governing behavior to meet long-term goals, um, can all those those can be really challenging. So as a result, you might see um, more reckless and risk-taking behaviors, or maybe they they swing the other way, right, and be become avoidant. Um, of any risk. Um, so these can all be potential ways in which we see some of the impact um, on behavioral um, development. And getting um, development back on track. So despite the complex ways that um, the experience of trauma can impact youth, we know that there's ways that we can help get development back on track so we can help you feel empowered is one of the most effective tools for countering the helplessness that can often um, happen when youth experience um, trauma and can in turn build their confidence in managing their emotions and behaviors. One of the first ways you can empower youth is just helping them understand their behaviors for what they are and what their and, and understand what their reactions are. So um, even this alone, right, just naming those experiences, those feelings can make them feel maybe less childish or less overwhelmed, right? Um, so a couple of tips to think about is how we verbally translate their behaviors by explaining how those behaviors may be emotions rather than just anger. Um, privately discuss with the youth how their thoughts and emotions um, particularly re related to things like trauma reminders and triggers and early warning signs and how all of those things can in impact behavior. So again, just having um, those um, you know, deep understandings of, um, of the complexity of emotion and helping help validating those complex feelings that they might have um, can be helpful. Organizing pro-social activities, giving youth choices when we're able to, right? Building their confidence. Um, and coping strategies, which is something that my colleagues will be talking a little bit more about in future in, a, in another session. Um, okay, I recognize that we're almost out of time here. So um, just a, another thought on accountability or empowerment and accountability through restorative um, practices. Um, so we know that um, Empowerment strategy helps support um, one one final empowerment strategy to consider is how we support accountability so restorative justice, which is something that maybe you all um, are, already do or know quite a bit about but that's one tool. Um, that allows the youth to who has maybe committed an offense to negotiate with the, the victim about how best to um, repair the harm that's been caused. Um, by their actions. So whether it's um, the harm is emotional or physical, um, thinking about how we provide opportunities to understand the level of dom um, damage that may have been caused by the youth and then prompt repair to that damage can be one way um, to support um, uh, the youth, you know, having some accountability in that and feeling confident in their ability to manage some of those and negotiate some of those relationships. And then helping youth get back on track, recognize that the results of trauma or bad seeds that have been planted. I think so often, you know, we don't get to see the full range of a particular case. Um, and so just acknowledging that the work that you are doing is so incredibly important and that you're planting seeds, right? Building resiliency and achieving recovery takes time. It's important to acknowledge the possibilities that can ar arise from planting those new seeds um, and being confident that efforts and the community connections you provide for youth will help make recovery possible. I think we're really short on time, so we may not have questions, but I did put my um, email in the chat um, earlier in the session. I think it will also be available to you all. So if you have um, questions that uh, we can answer via email too, I would be happy to do that. I think I'll turn Thank you so much, ladies. Really appreciate it. Thank you all for attending
Oh, Tasha, I think we lost you a little bit. Um, I believe there was a link to an evaluation in the chat. Um, and just as a way of closing, I want to thank you all um, for being here. And um, thank you. Yep, session evaluation. Um, thank you for joining us. And it's always um, great to spend time, even if just really briefly these few minutes um, amongst so many people who um, care about the youth in their communities um, and just be in the presence of those collective efforts um, that we know are taking place in your communities to support the strength and resiliency of the youth in your care. So thank you.